Hey folks, welcome to lecture 15. In this lecture, I'm going to spend time reviewing all the topics we've covered over the past few weeks so you can earn the best grade possible on midterm two. So no new material is going to be presented. Now, in order to help you prepare for midterm two, I've uploaded several resources. One being an extensive study guide that has several practice questions at the end and I'm going to upload a practice exam. Both of these materials should help you prepare for the midterm exam. After the midterm exam is over, the class is going to shift gears again. We are going to enter the third phase of the quarter in which we focus on a lot of the social aspects of plants. This is going to include things like agriculture, debates around GMOs, moving on to things like plant poisons, drug discovery, a little bit of ethnobotany, and finally plants in art and music. Remember, if you have any questions or you need help, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to meet with you in a Zoom office hours. At the end of today's lecture, I'm gonna give you a little bit of tips and tricks for preparing for midterm two, so make sure you stay to the end and have a watch. Let's get started. On Wednesday's lecture, I almost forgot to give you an update on the plant growth experiment. So I did go um, on this previous Monday to go and measure the plants and have a look at the progress. And essentially what I'm seeing is a continuation of the trend that we noticed from last week. The FERT FERT group is doing really well. Nice, big, healthy green leaves. You can see that the stem is nice and thick and most of these plants are growing very straight and very strong. The FERT, um, water only with the low nut nutrient soil. They're doing pretty good as well. Not quite as good as the FERT, FERT example, but still doing really good. The stems are nice and thick and healthy and they're cooking along no problem. Now, this next group is a little trickier. So our DIY water group here, one of the things you'll notice is that just like last week, you can see that the stem does not you know, look really robust, it's kind of thin. In this case, this plant over here, you can see, if you look closely, a split along the length of the stem. The leaves are actually not looking quite as nice, and so you can see that they're green, but maybe a little bit pale yellow are starting to um, sort of trend that way. And then our tap water group is actually looking pretty sickly. They're very, very thin. The plants look pretty stressed out. Many of them are bent over, um, and in fact, some of them are starting to die. With the DI water group, this plant in the very back here, you can see it broke over and it's not gonna come back. So nothing we can do for that, um, that poor one there. All right, so this is your update, and I will come back to this uh, this coming Monday and hopefully upload the data so you can see how the growth is doing as well. So stay tuned. In this lecture, we'll review the content for your midterm two exam and go over plant evolution and ecology. Our next lecture will be focused on agriculture. Let's first start by reconsidering the water to land transition in plants. Remember that in order to transition to life on land, plants had to solve several problems. Those problems included things like how to support themselves, how to effectively reproduce, how to prevent desiccation, etc. Four features really stand out as land plant adaptations to life on land. These are the multicellular sporophyte, a waxy cuticle, protected embryos, and sporopollenin. Remember that ancestrally, plants had a haplontic life cycle. This is a life cycle in which the gametophyte is the dominant stage, and there is no multicellular diploid stage. And so we get the alternation of generations life cycle effectively by instead of undergoing immediate meiosis, once we formed a zygote, we hold on to that zygote. We retain the zygote, let it divide mitotically, and then we end up with a multicellular diploid generation. That's the sporophyte. Once we have a sporophyte, we can make spores, and so we've effectively solved 
one of the problems in transitioning to life on land. We no longer rely on zoospores that are present in a haplontic life cycle with algae and instead have airborne spores like we do in land plants. Let's move on to talk about the first lineages that transition to life on land, the bryophytes. Recall that in bryophytes, we have a gametophyte dominant generation. This means that the primary photosynthetic part of the plant is the plant that has one copy of chromosomes per cell. It's the gametophyte. It's very similar to what you would find in aquatic algae. So we have a dominant gametophyte, but because we retained that zygote and allowed it to undergo mitotic division, we end up with a multicellular diploid stage called the sporophyte. But that sporophyte is still attached and nutritionally dependent upon the gametophyte. It may be green for a short period of time and able to do its own photosynthesis, but very quickly it turns brown. So it is reliant on the gametophyte for its nutrition. One of the big picture ideas about bryophytes is that they tend to be relatively small plants. So they lack xylem and phloem. For that reason, they're oftentimes referred to as the non-vascular plants. There's three main lineages, the liverworts, which have the smallest sporophytes, moss, which are intermediate, and hornworts, which have persistently growing sporophytes. Many bryophytes have rhizoids that anchor the plant and do water absorption. And you might at first glance look at these and think they're roots, but they are definitely not true roots. They just help to increase surface area for water absorption and to anchor the plant. They all have sporangia, and remember that sporangia produce spores. Angium means house or container, and so sporangium is the house or container that produces the spores. They also have gametangia. Angium means house or container, so gametangium means these are the structures that produce the gametes, which are sperm and egg. One thing that came up in the playposit questions is that people are still a little bit confused about how water and sugars make their way through the main body of a bryophyte. Remember, they don't have xylem and phloem, so one constraining thing on their size is that they have to rely on osmosis and diffusion to transport water and nutrients throughout the plant. This means they really can't get very big. It isn't just the fact that they don't have any structural support, it's the fact that they don't have any mechanism by which they can transport water and nutrients. Those processes, diffusion and osmosis, kind of keep the mosses, liverworts, and hornworms to a really relatively small size. Let's move on to the first group of vascular plants, the seedless vascular plants. So now that we've transitioned to the vascular plants, remember that these plants have xylem and phloem for efficient transport of water and sugars. This allows for several things to happen. One is that the plants get a lot larger, and two is that they have a lot more complex patterns of growth. This is what I mean by a dominant branching sporophyte. So remember that they have tracheids, which conduct water, some species have vessel elements, these are the angiosperms and some nidophytes, but they also have sieve tubes for transporting sugar. And remember, sieve tubes have companion cells because they lack organelles and have to control the processes, the cellular processes within those cells. Another question that we talked about on PlayPosit is what the advantage is of having a large dominant sporophyte. So once you have a large dominant sporophyte, you have increased production of spores. Remember the job of the sporophyte is to make, make spores. So if you have a really big sporophyte, you can make a lot of spores. Once you have a lot of spores, they're also a lot taller because they're structurally more stable, so they can disperse those spores over a wider area. In addition to the increased production of spores, make sure you understand that you also have a larger branched sporophyte. So that means that you end up with increased photosynthetic 
capacity. Recall that in seedless vascular plants, the gametophytes are small and live independently of the sporophyte. That's not just true for ferns as I'm showing you here, it's true for both lycophytes and manilophytes. They have very small but freely living, i.e. nutritionally independent, gametophytes. And the job of the gametophyte is to, is to produce sperm and egg. But the sperm still have to swim through water in order to reach the egg. Now I know I've talked about this a lot over the past several lectures, but I just want to come back and re-emphasize that a big part of the story of the evolution of land plants is in understanding their life cycles. We go from a gametophyte dominant body like we see in the bryophytes to a sporophyte dominant body, which is what we see in all vascular plants. Remember, this is really culminated in the evolution of angiosperms, where the gametophyte, the megagametophyte specifically, is only seven cells big. So what we see is this incredible shrinking gametophyte phenomenon where in mosses, liverworts, and hornworts, we have a gametophyte that's dominant with a sporophyte that's attached to manilophytes where the gametophyte and sporophyte are separate entities, yet the gametophyte's really small, to something like seed plants where the gametophyte is dependent on the very large dominant sporophyte. To illustrate this a little bit further, remember that the reduction of the gametophyte is a trend that we see across vascular plants. Remember that in angiosperms, that megagametophyte is just seven cells. So we start with the moss, and the gametophyte is colored in gold, and the sporophyte's in blue. We get to the fern, where the gametophyte is very, very small relative to the sporophyte, something about as big as your pinky fingernail. We get to gymnosperms, where the microgametophyte is the pollen grain, which you see at the very bottom, and the megagametophyte is still relatively large and has archegonia. And then we get to angiosperms, where the megagametophyte is just seven cells big and the pollen remains. Now, one thing I'll mention that is of interest here is that with moss and ferns, you have devoted very obvious gametangia. So you have antheridia and archegonia. But once you have the evolution of pollen, the gametophyte is so small that you can no longer have antheridia. So in all seed plants, antheridia are lost. But the female gametophyte, i.e. the megagametophyte, is still big enough to have archegonia. Once you get to angiosperms, the archegonia are also lost. So again, what you see is this trend of the incredible shrinking gametophyte. Let's move on to the seed plants. The seed plants represent the bulk of plant diversity. They have seeds, pollen, and secondary growth, although secondary growth is lost in monocots. All seeds have some shared fundamental characteristics. They have a seed coat, which is derived from integument layers, and those are diploid. They have an embryo, which represents the next sporophyte generation and is also diploid. And they have nutritive tissue. That nutritive tissue varies depending on whether or not you're a gymnosperm or you are an angiosperm. If you're a gymnosperm, that nutritive tissue is the haploid remains of the megagametophyte. But if you are an angiosperm, then that nutritive tissue is the product of double fertilization. Pollen is the microgametophyte. A lot of people confuse pollen with spores, so it's really important to understand that pollen is actually the gametophyte, so it's the product of the mitotic division of the microspore. Because spores have sporopollenin, pollen also has sporopollenin, which helps it stay sort of tough and prevents it from desiccation. The last characteristic of seed plants is secondary growth. Remember, primary growth is up and down, but secondary growth is width. 
secondary growth occurs from a bifacial vascular cambium. And that BVC layer is predicated on whether or not you have ordered vascular bundles. Remember, monocots have scattered vascular bundles. So while ancestrally, all seed plants have this secondary growth, this is actually lost in monocots. Heterospory is a modification of the alternation of generations life cycle where you have two sizes of spores. The smaller spore, which is the microspore, eventually develops into the microgametophyte, which in seed plants is also known as pollen. The megaspore varies. So in gymnosperms, the megaspore undergoes a lot of mitotic division to grow into a relatively large structure that has archegonia. But in angiosperms, it undergoes only a few rounds of mitotic division to grow into something that has seven cells and eight nuclei. Remember, all seed plants are heterosporous, but in angiosperms, we have the addition of fruit and flowers. Remember that angiosperms represent about 90% of plant diversity. So one obvious question might be what makes them so successful? Tied to this is this idea of Darwin's abominable mystery. Remember, he predicted that there should be gradual change. And so when he looked into the fossil record to find a history of angiosperm evolution, he found none. Instead, what he found is the sudden appearance of angiosperms in the fossil record. And this was rather shocking because he expected to find intermediate stages into the development of a flower. So flowers are one of the defining characteristics of angiosperms, and they're comprised of both reproductive and non-reproductive whorls. Remember, one of the key parts of a flower, which is the ovary, is what usually, but not always, ripens into a fruit. Fruit enclose the seeds. And so this is something that's usually happening into a soft, squishy, sugary, sweet thing that's used for dispersal. But remember, there's also examples of fruit that are hard and dry. Recall from a previous lecture, we talked about sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds are actually fruit unless you take that seed out from the inside. So all of these are the product of a ripened ovary, and you should definitely understand the differences between the different fruit types. Remember, this is partly related to the number of flowers and the number of carpels. So if you have one flower and one carpel, you are a simple fruit. If you have one flower and many carpels, you're an aggregate fruit. And if you have many flowers with many carpels that end up fusing, you are a multiple fruit. We talked about some other examples, so you should go back and review those. The two largest groups of angiosperms are the monocots and eudicots. We also spent some time talking about the basal angiosperms, but when you think of the plants that people mostly interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, these are the monocots and eudicots. Remember, they have differences in their seeds, roots, vasculature, flowers, and pollen. You should go back and familiarize yourself with this chart so that if I showed you a picture of something like um, a leaf that showed netted leaf venation, you should be able to predict all the characteristics that are gonna be associated with that plant as a eudicot. In the past few meetings during office hours, some students have been asking about fruit types. It's actually really easy to get confused between simple, aggregate, and multiple fruits. And so in these office hour meetings, I have developed this chart to kind of help people see the differences. So why don't you take a moment and see if you can fill this in yourself. Have a look at the simple, aggregate, and multiple fruit types. See if you can tell me how many flowers are in each, how many carpels are in each, and maybe give an example or two. I'll give you a moment to work on that. All right, so let's fill this chart out together. 
One easy way of doing this is to start with the examples. And so if you think back to the lecture in which we talked about fruits, a good example of a simple fruit would be a blueberry. Uh, also something maybe like a tomato. Um, and let's think about the number of flowers here. So hopefully you realize that a simple fruit is there's one flower and there's actually just one carpal. Now that kind of presents us with a little bit of a challenge. So a blueberry might be kind of easier to understand this in this context. But a tomato, you know that if you cut a tomato open, you see lots of seeds. Now what does that mean? Does that mean that they were formed from lots of different carpals? And the answer is no. What you have is a tomato being formed from a single flower with a single carpal, but it can contain many different ovules. So if you think that each ovule, if fertilized, can develop into a seed, that's why you see simple fruit with lots of different seeds. It's because there are multiple ovules in there. Another good example of this might be a kiwi. All right, so now that we have a simple fruit worked out, let's go on to aggregate. Um, a good example of an aggregate fruit would be a blackberry, maybe a raspberry. And if you think about what those look like, it's almost like there's a whole bunch of little fruitlets stuck together. And if you look at a picture online, you'll see that an aggregate fruit actually has one flower, but there can be lots of carpels. I, some people say multiple carpels, but I think that that can get confusing with multiple fruits. So let's just stick with lots of carpels. And so each of those carpels has a single ovule which gets fertilized, and then the fruit that results, you see it's almost like a bunch of little fruitlets that are all stuck together. Now the last one's a little bit tricky, and a good example of a multiple fruit is a pineapple. Remember, it's always better to bring multiple pineapples to a party, and then you won't get confused with aggregate. Um, a pineapple is a good classic example. There's also another fruit called a noni. If you look that up, that's a great example of a multiple fruit. Now, what about flowers and carpels? Well, if you look at these online, what you notice is that a pineapple or a noni fruit, it represents the fusion of lots of different separate fruits. And so you actually have, I'm gonna put one flower here, but um, it's important to understand that the fruit itself is formed from more than one flower. So there's one flower with uh, one carpal for each of those flowers, but the flowers and carpels end up getting fused. So I'm gonna put a star here and a star here so that we understand that in something like a pineapple, you have lots of separate flowers um, and then you have a, each of those flowers has its own carpal. So you could, for example, let's actually change this and say there are lots of flowers um, and we'll say that each flower has its own carpal. And so I actually like this a lot better because it sort of gets at that idea that a pineapple or a noni fruit represents the fusion of all of those different carpels, each of which belongs to a single flower. Have a look at some examples online or go back to our previous lecture and this should help make some good sense. The next kind of fruit we'll talk about are accessory fruits. And remember, accessory fruits are fruits that are formed from tissue that is not the ovary. And in many cases, we talk about the fruit being formed from something called the receptacle. Now, if you delve into the world of fruits, you'll see that they're actually a lot more complicated than we've presented here in PLB 10, but these are the basic examples. Now, accessory fruits can be a little tricky, um, and so I want to highlight a couple of examples. The example that I'll talk about first is a strawberry, because we talked about that before. And if you look at this um, line drawing of a strawberry, you can see that the receptacle is this yellow part here, 
which is supporting a whole bunch of separate little carpels that are attached to it. So this is one way in which a receptacle presents itself. And you can see that the red fleshy part of the fruit are the remains of each of those carpels here. And so what you're eating mostly when you eat a strawberry is the receptacle. Now an apple is a little trickier. And one thing that helps is to realize that, you know, when you grab an apple, um, you're actually kind of grabbing it uh, upside down. And so if you wanted to look at it the way it came off the tree, you'd have to flip it over. And so if you think about the example of the apple on the right here, you'll see that this stalk is where the flower was attached. And this remnants of calyx, well, that's the leftover part of the flower. And so if you go over to the line drawing of an apple, um, again, we have our apple upside down here. The thing I want you to notice is that you have something called the hypanthium, which is actually kind of a, mod a modified receptacle that's sort of like a cup, and it represents the fusion of things like some sepals and petals and other parts of a flower. And so um, it's actually not just the ovary. It's the ovary fused with a bunch of other stuff. And so when you eat an apple, when you eat the fleshy part of the apple, you're eating the hypanthium. That's all the part that you, you know, eat and consume. And then what do you do? You throw out the core. Well, the core is actually the ovary. So this would be the leftover part of the ovary that wasn't feud, fused, and that's why you have the seeds inside. To figure out accessory fruits, oftentimes it requires a little bit of careful study. And of course, if I give you one on the exam, I'm gonna make it pretty clear. So hopefully that clears things up. The last kind of fruit I want to talk about is that fruit category, which we called caryopsis. Remember, caryopsis is when you have the ovary wall and seed coat fused. Now this is really important because if you remember from lecture one in the class, I told you that your food is almost entirely derived from flowering plants. Now I mean that in the broad sense of humanity. So just four cereal grains, cereal grains, sustain the majority of the human population. And these are things that are like corn, rice, wheat, millet, sometimes barley um, trades place with millet, just depending. Now, it's important to notice that each of these four do caryopsis. And so this is actually a really important category that we, we need to understand with the different fruit types. And another thing you might notice is that all four of these are actually monocots. So monocots are really important to sustain the human population. Let's move on to talk about plant communities. I know I gave a lot of examples about California, but one of the reasons why is because I think it's just an absolutely amazing state. Now we have kind of an unfair advantage because we occupy such a broad range of latitude, but nevertheless, we have many different kinds of plant communities within several different biomes. On PlayPosit, I asked you to sort of do a little bit of research and think about what other areas in the world might have something similar to a California climate. And a lot of people couldn't find any good examples, but there actually are several. So California tends to have what is called a Mediterranean climate. So it has cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers. And you can find examples of these in places like Chile, the Mediterranean Basin, South Africa, and even Australia. So while the fact remains that we are unique and quite special, there are a lot of other places in the world that have similar kinds of climate. Climate is a key factor in defining biomes. And in addition to things like global circulation patterns, temperature and precipitation have the largest influence. So in California, for example, we go from high to low temperatures. We also go from low to high rainfall. This is one of the reasons why we have so many different kinds of plant communities. Now, topography plays a really important role. 
And I also asked you a question on play pause it about topography. Remember that if you're down here in the Central Valley, you tend to have kind of a cool wet winter and a very hot dry summer. But as you go up in elevation, yeah, the pressure changes. Yes, you know, the air gets a little bit thinner, but what really happens is the temperature drops and you start to add a lot more rainfall. So these two factors really play the most significant role in defining what plant communities live there. So the four major factors that end up defining plant communities are climate, topography, soil types, and disturbance. And then again, going back to the California example, we have a broad range of climate, we have a broad range of topography, we have many different soil types, as you can see in this map in the middle, and of course, we have a long history of disturbance. Recall that plant communities change over time. Primary succession happens when you get the construction of new habitat. The really great example of this is like the emergence of a new volcanic island. Something a lot more common is secondary succession. And this is when you get the disturbance of an existing habitat from something like a forest fire. Given that California has experienced a lot of burning over the past five to 10 years, you can imagine that there are many examples of secondary succession happening in California right now. Our last lecture for this part of the quarter was on life history strategies. One of the absolutely amazing things about angiosperms is the diversity of flowers, shapes, and sizes that you see. Remember, these flowers are usually adapted to serve a certain kind of pollinator. And as Ernesto talked about, pollen really was the initial key to establishing this relationship, but lots of other rewards are provided to pollinators in the evolution of angi angiosperms, especially things like nectar. So what we see here is that there is a general trend where we can kind of predict what kind of pollinator ends up visiting a certain kind of flower. Now it's important to know this is not 100%, but in general, these are kind of rules of thumb. So things that are moth pollinated tend to be white. They're nocturnal animals, so they're not going to look for some really bright red, you know, starkly co uh, colored flower. They tend to have a strong odor and no landing pad, and that's because moths tend to hover. Hummingbirds also hover, but they're kind of on the lookout for those super bright flowers with lots of nectar. Flies are really obvious. The flower color tends to be mottled, kind of like rotting meat, and they have a really strong odor. Bees also have a landing pad with lots of nectar and also lots of pollen. On this bee, you can see the large pollen sacs there where they're collecting pollen to return to the hive. Now another pollinator that I think is worth mentioning are bats. And bats are really drawn to nectar. So bat pollinated flowers tend to also only bloom at night. They have no landing pad because they can hover and also lots of nectar. I gave you three examples of the consequences of pollinators in the evolution of angiosperms. One really interesting example that's in California are monkey flowers. Remember, monkey flowers are one example where pollinator preference has led to reproductive isolation. Recall that in our definition of speciation, one of the key features we look for is this idea of reproductive isolation, but plants oftentimes kind of blur these lines. And so mimulus flowers can reproduce in the lab. You can easily create hybrids. The same is also true for other plants. So orchids are another example where hobbyists oftentimes end up crossing different orchid species and making new hybrids, but that's something that would never happen in the wild. And the reason why is because of pollinator preference. So Mimulus lewisii is a flower that's only pollinated by bees, and Mimulus cardinalis is a flower that's only pollinated by hummingbirds. So because the hummingbirds never visit Mimulus lewisii, you never get that chance for outcrossing or interbreeding. Epiphytes and parasites are really interesting because they have to kind of solve the same sorts of problems. 
So epiphytes, because they don't have any roots and they live on other plants, they have no way where they can connect to the ground and draw up nutrients and water. So in a lot of ways, they have similarities to things like cacti, where they have C4 photosynthesis and a lot of other tricks up their sleeve to prevent water loss. Trichomes are another example, and if we were in the conservatory, I could show you that with trichomes, when the plant is not wet, i.e. when it's not raining in the wild, you get this really sharp reflection of sunlight to prevent desiccation. But as soon as the plant gets wet, those trichomes all turn green and the plant actively photosynthesizes. They also have lots of stem modifications where they reduce the size of their leaves to prevent water loss. Now, one really interesting solution to the problem of nutrients is that epiphytes oftentimes end up sort of making relationships with animals that defecate or bring other kinds of sources of nutrients into them. So there's great examples of modified epiphytes where they've modified their stems to attract home for ants, and then they capitalize on the nutrients that are provided by the ants. The example I gave in lecture was a bromeliad where these poison arrow frogs have to go somewhere to lay their eggs in water. And a good place would be a bromeliad, and in so doing, they provide nutrients to the plant. Truly parasitic plants are another sort of story altogether, where instead of just living on another plant, they actually draw some of their nutrients and water from the host. So something like mistletoe, which I find kind of funny because, you know, get, get a kiss under a mistletoe is actually a plant parasite that eventually can end up killing the host plant versus something like daughter, which has absolutely lost all of its chlorophyll and can no longer photosynthesize and instead invades the host plant and steals its sugars and nutrients. I'll end with this idea of symbioses. And remember, we've talked about nitrogen-fixing bacteria several times over the course of the lectures. And I find that interesting because bacteria are the only organisms that really are able to fix atmospheric nitrogen. There's some archaea. Bacteria are the real key players, though, and nitrogen is essential for all life. So something like Azola um, has cyanobac cyanobacteria that are symbionts that are able to fix atmospheric nitrogen. There's even some really interesting stories where in the Vietnam War, as uh, the Vietnamese were growing rice, what they did is put lots of azola into the rice paddies because they didn't um, have a means of acquiring the um, synthetically produced nitrogen to support their crops. And so azola is kind of like a natural fertilizer for the plants uh, where it grows near. I hope that review lecture was helpful. Let's think about the upcoming midterm two exam. The first important thing to know is that your exam happens next Wednesday from 11 to 11.50, just like last time. I tend to add a, a few minutes of extra sponge time just to give everybody a chance to settle down. So please make sure you look for the class announcement with all of the details. The most important thing to know is that even though I'm there to proctor you on Zoom, I am there to support you as you work through the exam. So if you get stuck or need help, please feel free to send me a private chat on Zoom so that I can help you work through any problems that you're having. The next most important thing is to make sure that you're spending a lot of time with the study guide. You should be able to answer all of the questions that are listed and work with the vocabulary without referring back to your notes. If you can do that, I'm sure you're going to do a fantastic job. Students who oftentimes run out of time on online exams do so because they're relying on looking all the details up as they work through the exam. Have some confidence. You've learned a lot over the past few weeks, and I'm sure you know a lot more than you think you do. The next bit of advice I can give you is that things like shared Google Docs can be a really helpful resource. And I have no problem if you want to work with each other on Discord, 
make a shared Google Doc so that you fill in the answers to the study guide and help each other with the questions as long as there is no collaboration on the actual exam. So you shouldn't have that open during the exam, but if you do want to work with it as a preparatory sort of exercise, I'm more than happy to encourage that. And if you want to add me, I'll even go onto the Google Doc and check some of the answers you're having uh, trouble with. Um, the last important detail is that your exam structure will be about the same as midterm one, but it's gonna be a little bit more challenging, not only because of the breadth of material, but also because of the numerous details. Now, I'm not going to get overly obsessed with all the little details, but you should have a good and clear understanding of the big picture concepts. So please make sure you know, for example, all the structures on plants that we talk about. Students often get tripped up if they're asked to label parts on plants. You should understand the life cycles. What's a spore? What's gametes? Um, how does double fertilization work in angiosperms? And then lastly, make sure you know a lot of the examples that we talked about, especially over the past couple of lectures. I gave you some spe um, specific examples to learn, and of course, all the field trips that we've taken over the, t over the um, past few weeks really are meant to emphasize some of these details. All right, if you have any questions or you need help, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to meet with you in a Zoom office hours, and I will look forward to seeing you on Monday.